This week's guest has always radiated positivity and radiated energy and sunshine to me. Virginia Kerr used to be on TV. She was a news reporter. She was a news anchor. And she just seemed like she had it all together. And we all know what happens when you think those things. Comparison. It's just evil. There's always something someone is struggling with. And Virginia struggled with some major demons, but she hit it well. We talk about it in this week's episode. What happens when you put a career-focused woman with two kids trying to balance home and work life in a room with a microphone? Lots of laughter, tears, and great advice. I'm Jill Devine, and welcome to Two Kids and a Career. I just wish people could know behind the scenes of what just let up before this recording started. (laughs) It was a lot of, what in the heck? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? What are you doing? What are you doing? But it's so great to hear your voice, Virginia Kerr. I got to tell you, even though we can't see each other, I can see your smile and I can feel your positive energy because that's just the kind of person you are. And I am so happy to have you on. Oh, thank you for that. That makes me feel so good. I'm excited (laughs) to be here. (laughs) Well, we met a long time ago. I don't know if you remember this. Um, I was doing radio morning show and it was when uh, the stripper pole uh, classes were really, really popular. Yes. And we did this strip club pole dance, whatever you call it. Um, that's where we first met. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. Was it Clayton? I'm trying to remember. I've been, yes, I, it was. Okay. Yes. I remember it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, for those of you that are listening that are from the St. Louis area, you probably remember Virginia. She was um, on the news. She was a reporter. She was an anchor. She did it all. And that's how I knew of you. And then you went away. And I didn't really know what happened. And then I saw you back for a little bit with somebody else that's really known in St. Louis, Tim Azell. And then I just started seeing you all over my Instagram. And I was like, what (laughs) is going on with this woman? I need to know. And to be completely honest with you, Virginia, when we were setting this up, I was just really excited to talk to you and see how you had transformed from TV to what you're doing now, which we're going to talk about. And I didn't know that there's a little bit of a dark side that has led you to where you are now and some demons. And I'm just very grateful that you are going to talk to me about it and to my listener. And I have to tell you, reading some of the things on your blog, I was able to relate in a different way, which I'll explain. But I mean, we might as well not leave the listener in suspense Tell mm-hmm. us what happened. Well, it's it's almost like a not a, a what happened, but just like who I really was. Because honestly, this started when I was a kid. I mean, I didn't identify and put all the pieces together until the last several years. But, um, you know, I started binge eating when I was 13. We had, you know, some life events happen. My dad was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and it, And every time he went through a cycle, it got worse and worse. And I was in a family where we didn't have great communication skills. We didn't talk about things. We just tried to pretend like nothing was going on other than when we were at home and everything was in disarray. So I I started to eat my feelings away. And that went on for years. I mean, and, and looking back, I really was depressed and it wasn't diagnosed. And so I just isolated and binge ate on in every single television market I was in. Uh, it just got worse and worse. And then I started drinking during those years. But when I finally overcame the binge eating, I stopped, I had gone to counseling and I stopped going to counseling and it just slowly morphed into drinking. And looking back, it's just because I never really learned how to cope with my feelings. I I think I compartmentalized things. So I thought, oh, everything is wrong in the family department with my dad. I didn't put two and two together that it was, it had taught me how to let people treat me, but also, um, become like this never ending people pleaser. And so anyway, long story short, I 
I finally just had to put an end to it in November of 2018. Yes. And when I finally did that and I started to peel back the layers of, of why I always had to isolate and eat or drink to prevent myself from having to deal with my feelings, I started to realize that I didn't really know who I was. Like, you know what I mean? I just, Mm -hmm. I think I numbed everything so much that I never even allowed myself to get to know myself. And I was always trying to impress people and please people to the point that I didn't even know what I wanted. And so that's where this whole thing came from as far as what I do now. And I'm not on television, but I'm on the internet. What actually made you decide to leave the television world? So I had a son and and looking back, like I always joke with my husband, I'm like, I bet if I went back to television news, I would, I would enjoy it and I would be more enjoyable to be around because I was just a broken person even back, I mean, well, all of the time. But anyway, so uh, I had my son and I realized I can't keep up this pace. You know, my priorities changed. I, I was no longer on the news after I went back to work because I thought, well, I told my GM, I was like, I cannot report to work at 2.30 in the morning with a newborn. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not happening. So he moved me to a lifestyle show And I learned so much on that show because it was really run by the sales department. So I learned a lot about video marketing and sales just because I, you know, I would be assigned a client and it was my job to produce the segment to make it entertaining, but also make the client happy. So I learned a lot during that, but I still just, I I just was kind of done with the stress of it all and the sacrifice of it all. And I decided to replace my income. So I started a business on the side. And I replaced my income and I walked away in December of 2014. But the reason, the main reason, it wasn't just to replace my income. I had gotten the idea for the TV show that I eventually did with Tim. And so my big goal was to make enough money so that I could, you know, launch that. Okay. So that's what we did in 2016. We launched that TV show. So you are not on it anymore. And is that a decision that you made or? Yes. Okay. It's all part of all of this. So here's the crazy thing. So Timmy Zell, who is the co-host of the show called The Thread, he was mm-hmm. my co-host at the time. He's the, he's the primary and only host now. He is a recovered alcoholic. And so I was working my butt off trying to maintain this side business that I had, you know, started, launch a TV show with Tim, who we would openly talk about his history with drinking. And and then behind the curtains, Tim didn't know I was drinking two bottles of wine a night, you know, because I was trying to he deal didn't... with all of the anxiety of all of this. Yeah, I didn't tell him. I, nobody knew how much I drank except maybe my husband. Maybe. Oh, okay. Okay. And and so um I can't remember exactly when it was, but I was talking to a woman about being on the show The Thread, which the, by the way, The Thread is all about sharing people's stories mm-hmm. and sharing how they overcame a struggle and they use that experience to help other people who are dealing with similar struggles. And so her story was anxiety and panic attacks and how she had run herself in the ground. And I'm talking to her about this over coffee one day. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she is totally describing me. Like I was having anxiety attacks. And it was simply because I I had, well, said yes to too many people, too many things. And I was running nonstop workaholic, basically drinking to try to, you know, manage the stress and it was killing me. And so I, I told her, I mean, I I didn't tell her all of that, but it, that conversation led me to talk to my co-host Tim about it. And he said, whatever you need to do, we need to get you in a better place. And that, that was me stepping off of the show. Did I quit drinking then? No. Oh. <laughs> I, I tried. I had, I convinced myself that, oh, well, if I just could manage my schedule and not do so much, then I wouldn't drink as much. But the problem is drinking was the symptom, not the problem. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't the problem, but it was it was the symptom of all the things that I had discussed earlier, which was I never learned how to address my feelings. I never learned how to properly communicate with people and set boundaries. I never learned any of that. So it wasn't until I finally quit drinking, which was a year after that, that I started to learn how to do all that. How interesting because you are 
choosing a profession where it's all about communication. I know. And, <laughs> and then, okay, so this show that you came up with, you stepped away and you, I can tell because you want people to have a voice and you want to help people. You're letting them still do this. You're letting them still tell this story that you really created. I knew in my gut, I mean, I didn't know how it was all going to play out, but I was, if I went into the whole story of that show, it, it's it's miraculous because I, I do believe it was just a calling. And I felt like, I didn't even know Tim, by the way. Tim and I, we worked at different TV stations. I just felt like God was saying, Tim is going to be your co-host. And I also felt in my gut that one day I would walk away from it, that it wasn't my show, it was going to be his. So it, I didn't think it would pan out that the way that it w- went down, but it did. And I don't regret it. I'm so thrilled that the show is still going on and that it's a success. I mean, I think it's a gift to the community. Um, I don't, I think God just gave me the idea and Tim has been the perfect person to make it happen and keep it alive. Um, yeah. So it's still on. It's called The Thread because they're they're weaving people together one story at a time. As cheesy as that sounds, that's what it's all about. Nope, it's not cheesy at all. And you know, it's it's funny because you think with, you know, when I was on the radio, you know everybody on the, the competitors and you don't always. And so I kind of thought that that was the way it was with TV. But you and Tim, for not knowing each other, totally gelled. It felt like you guys had a history together. So, wow, what a what a calling that one was. And in any time I've been with Tim or had to in, uh, interact with him, he's just a great, great human that you want part of your life. Oh, so yes, everybody needs to know Tim. <laughs> okay. So you leave because you know that you need to get better, but you said you didn't stop drinking what? I tried. I was sober tried. for two weeks. Yes. Okay. Two weeks is better than, than zero. Right. So then what what was it? You just woke up one day? Yeah, honestly. So when you drink like that, you're like, because I would drink myself to sleep basically. And, and I never would get good sleep. So I would always wake up at 3 a.m. And I and I was waking up every morning at 3 a.m. with the voices of you're disgusting. Ugh. You don't deserve the life that you've been given because you're just worthless. I mean, a terrible voice. They 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 say that drinking can lead to a slow suicide. And I I get it now because I the things I was telling myself. But what I also recognized was it was very similar to the way that I woke up when I was eating so much. And the very first thing that I would think when I would wake up after a binge eating was, what did you eat? How disgusting are you? Why would you do that? What are you going to do today? You know, it, it was the exact same pattern. And so I recognized that and I thought, I I can't live like this anymore. And so I started reading every book I could get my hands on about just drinking and being addicted to it. And, and that's basically what, I, oh, and podcasts. I mm-hmm. listened to a couple of podcasts and I mean, I would, I became addicted to the podcast basically. And on the days that I wanted to go buy a bottle of wine, I would listen to like five episodes of people who had relapsed just to, you know, remind myself of how miserable it would be to go back down that path. So when I, I want to try to address this in in a couple of things, because when I was reading some of your story, I think it's easy for people to not understand if they aren't a fan of alcohol or they just, I mean, they just don't drink. They drink every now and again and they're like, oh, okay, how hard can it be? I will tell you that I'm probably one of those people. I'll drink here and there socially. Sometimes I'll get a little drunk of that's just what happens and no big deal. And I just, I don't like the way that it makes me feel the next day, but how I really, really connected was thinking about smoking. I used to smoke and that's another one where people would be like, well, I never did that. So I don't get it. But this was how I connected with you and, 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 and it made sense. Like 
when you were saying, oh, you could just have one. You could just have one glass of wine. And I kept would say to myself, I could just have one cigarette. Or I would just try to justify every reason I could to go get a, a pack of cigarettes and just do that. And it was like, no, you can't. Once you start, you're going to start and you're going to keep smoking and you're going to wake up. And, and the same thing when I would try to quit. And then the next day after whatever, just stress or whatever, and I would smoke more. I'm like, why am I smoking more? This is it. And I would play those those scenarios in my head. This is what made me finally kind of realize I don't want to say what it's like to be an alcoholic because I don't know, but it made me realize a little bit more of the difficulty it must be for you and anyone that's fighting addiction. Yeah. I, I think that understanding anything helps us overcome it. And so when I was learning about how the brain works and how, especially if someone is escaping some kind of trauma, uh, the, the brain will just, it just learns that that's going to happen. Like you can tell yourself all day, I'm not going to drink today. I don't want it. You can wake up hungover and feel disgusting and, you know, or sick. And then once that time of day hits that you normally would start drinking, you're, you may not want to do it, but your brain is like, this is what we have to have. Mm. And so when I, when I learned all the chemical, I mean, I didn't learn everything, but I learned enough, you know, to understand that, oh, this is, I'm not a bad person. My brain has just been trained to think that it has to have this to calm down. And so I, I learned how to prepare for the witching hour, if you will. And eventually, eventually those cravings go away. But what happens along the way, even though it's the most difficult part of the journey, is when you start to identify the triggers and the, and not just like the places that you are or, or being hungry and tired, but also the thoughts, then you start to ask yourself, well, why does that make me want to drink? And that was the key to everything. When I started to reverse engineer, why did I have that you know, sudden desire to drink. And then I realized, oh, you know, this person made me angry or I'm in a situation where I feel really insecure and self-conscious right now. Then I started to really understand my feelings. And then that gave me this sense, I don't want to say power, but control over the situation. So you just sit with it. If you sit long enough and there's a saying, you know, think through the drink. If you sat there and think, okay, if I have one drink, is that really going to be enough? No, mm, I would be right. super frustrated. I would want to have eight glasses of wine and not one glass of wine. And then by the time I sit there and think all that through, I've I've kind of thought the craving away, if you will. Okay, so someone is at home or they're on a walk or they're in their car taking a drive and they need help. What do you tell them? I tell them that they are not a bad person. They're they're not a disgusting person like they probably feel and that they just have a brain that is it has been taught that it needs alcohol and the only way to overcome that is to go and find someone who gets it. If you don't want to go to a meeting, then find a friend or find a podcast, but you've got to start listening to other people's stories so that you know you are not alone. It's funny. I felt the same way about binge eating. I thought nobody in the world has this problem but me. Like, why in the world can I not get it together? And then when I started to, I mean, back then, they, social media wasn't a thing and it wasn't as easy to access stories like this. And I think people are, there are way more people now willing to share their stories. But you know, back then, if I had just heard someone say that they eat themselves to sleep every day or that they can't control, you know, their desire to eat nonstop, I would have known that I was not alone and that there was also hope out there that that I can overcome this because other people have done it. I'm not even kidding, Jill. I seriously felt like I was just cursed and doomed to be miserable the rest of my life back in those days. I just thought you've just been dealt a bad hand and this is it. This is just too bad for you. You're never going to be happy. It's why I married somebody I should have never married. I, I thought, well, this is this must be as happy as it gets. Even though, And looking back, I'm like, oh, so sad that I just would accept anything because I just felt like I just would never be happy. I didn't know what that felt like to be happy. 
And it's just until now. <laughs> it's so weird too, because again, I guess that's silly saying 2020 is hindsight. Like I can hear the smile in your voice. And I always could see that on you too. I mean, obviously you were on TV and you had to put on a show, but I felt like even the times that I did see you out and about, it, I mean, it wasn't like we were always out and about, but there were different paths where you crossed and you saw each other. I just... I just felt like everything was okay for you. You were happy, Virginia. Isn't that... It's stupid. I know. Because everybody has their stuff. Yeah. I I think that there is a a part of... I love... I've always been fascinated with video and television since I was a kid. So that part of me, when I was in front of the camera, that was... I can't explain it. It's... to this day, there's just something about it that lights me up and that like forgets everything. But the truth is I didn't have friends. Like I lived for my career. My career was in my opinion, at the, you know, what I believed was if you could make it in television, you will finally be a somebody and you will finally be happy. But the problem is your brain goes with you everywhere you go. And so I might've been happy for the first few months at a job, not even that. I wouldn't even give myself months, maybe the first few weeks, and then it would all catch up with me. And so I think that's why I was able to put on that show, that front. And it doesn't, it's not like it's all magically gone away. I still struggle with things. I mean, I still have a, you know, a tendency to want to make sure everything looks perfect. Like somebody wrote the other day because she found my podcast and she was like, I thought you were perfect Barbie until I found your podcast and realized that, oh my goodness, you're so relatable. And I'm like, yeah, I still have that issue. Like I have to remind myself to be real, you know, not to make it always look like I've got everything just right. Um, so anyway, my point is it's, it's an ongoing process is what well, I'm trying you're to say. human, you're a human <laughs> yeah. being and that's the way it works. You know, it's some, it's funny. Um, Dave Hallis, he has a new book yeah, and yeah. one of the things that he talks about is how your job doesn't define who you are. And he mm-hmm. struggled with that a lot. And, and, and you think, think about that. And, and one of the things that, you know, he kind of talked about is, accepting or being accepted that because he had this job with this title and this and that and that, that means that he's worth more and he's a better person. And he said it took him a while to realize like, that's just, that's not, not true. And I think a lot of people fall into that category. Um, Leading into your business, I mean, you were talking about the video side and TV and how it just lights you up. You took a big risk and you decided to do something on your own. And maybe it's not even a big risk, but talk about what you're doing now and the passion it brings you. So I honestly, I just started this at the end of last summer. So I was in um, network marketing. That was the business that I did to replace my income. And I just, I I, I was really struggling with it because I, I couldn't put my finger on like, why it wasn't working anymore, the things that they they teach you. Um, and, and then I started to realize why it, it did work for me. And that's because, yes, I was, I mean, and I got asked that all the time, like, oh, don't you think you did so well because you were on television? And I would say, well, yeah, I did. But looking back, I was doing, when I was on that show, that lifestyle show, and I was learning all about branding and video marketing to help my clients, I was applying a lot of that to what I did with my network marketing business just because I was on television. People got to know me, so I I did have a name. But now, people watch their phones. They don't watch TV. And I started Mm -hmm. to realize, oh my goodness, I can teach what I taught those clients. I can teach that to on online business owners. And I love it. And I had fallen out of, not out of love. I just kind of had forgotten about it because I I think I had compartmentalized that too. Well, you're not on TV, so you don't do video anymore. Mm. And so I'm like, well, well I'm going to start trying to do video. And it's funny, when I got on Instagram, I was so scared just to post an Instagram story. Looking back, I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like, <laughs> A camera is a camera. So I slowly taught myself and I got really into marketing. I started reading a ton of books. I, I flew out to conferences and I just got really... I just got fascinated all over again by it. And I was having fun with it. And one night I just thought, what if I started a video coaching 
business? What would that look like? And I'm not going to lie. It's been super scary. And there are days where I'm on a complete high and I'm loving it. And then there's Mm -hmm. the next day where I'm like, what in the world are you thinking? Why do you think you could pull this off? But I think that's just being an entrepreneur in general. Yep. Yep. And then Corona happened. I know. (laughs) Screw you, Corona. (laughs) I know. know. But I'm just like, I had already, you know, start launched my business. And now people, I mean, they don't have a choice. Like they've got to figure out how to grow their business on social media. And video is the fastest way to get a complete stranger to know, like, and trust you. And what I think people have in their head is they have to be some perfect reporter like person to to pull it off and they don't they just have to be themselves and and know how to communicate what they're so good at so that people can learn from them which builds trust which if you have a business and you're selling any kind of product or service people need to trust you to make that happen and so i that's what i do now which is so crazy i literally literally work out of my laundry room <laughs> I'm well, I'm in the closet. So <laughs> Yeah, I call it my laundry office and I'm in here all day long playing TV on the internet and teaching other people how to do it too. But isn't it, it do you ever sit back and cuz I feel the same way with like I started launching all this right when everything was happening, but don't you feel and I thought about this with you before we started talking like you started doing this a little bit before all all of this is happening and people are trying to adapt quickly. And maybe you, you're a chapter ahead, I guess is the best way to say it. I think about that with myself in the podcast. Like I am a a chapter ahead of some people. So I do have the tools and the education with it and the same for you, but you already started where people are going to end up being. And I just, it's just weird how that all works out and how and life you're... works in your favor. Yep. Yes. Yep. I exactly. totally agree. When that hit me one day, I'm like, oh, I see what you did there, God. I see <laughs> exactly. what you did. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big old wink. Thank you very much, God. Yes. yes. It's, it's, I, I love those little aha moments when you mm-hmm. realize that sometimes we go through crap and we don't understand why in the world we're going through it. Yep. And it's all setting us up and preparing us for something. I, I don't even want to say bigger because to some people like working out of your laundry room and playing TV on the internet does not sound glamorous. <laughs> but for me, like I, I am a little kid again. Like this is what I used to do when I was a kid. I just did it in the bathroom in front of the mirror and I played TV then. And now I, I'm actually helping people with their businesses and their livelihood by doing the fun thing that I fell in love with when I was 11 years old. And it's just... I couldn't ask for anything better. I love it. (laughs) And I can hear it in your voice. And that was the other thing. When I knew I wanted to talk to you and I knew that we had the demons to talk about, I didn't want to just talk about that because you're beyond that. I mean, you have more to you. And that's why I really wanted to touch on that, but then also touch on where you are today because there's it, it, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Again, going back to someone that might be listening, you have hope. You have to do the work. It's not easy, but there is hope for what you want to do. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, whether it is, you know, to talk about their struggles or they have a business that they want the awesome Virginia Care to help them out with, how <laughs> should they reach you? And even your podcast too. Everything is, this is Virginia Kerr, which is I, I got that from signing off on a live report. You know how mm-hmm. reporting from St. Louis, this is Virginia Kerr. So anyway, uh, at this is Virginia Kerr on Instagram. That's the name of my podcast. This is Virginia Kerr. Kerr is spelled K-E-R-R. I'm inspired by you. I am loving the positivity. I am so proud of how far you've gone. So will it be two years in November that you're sober? Yes, two years. That's awesome. That's so Awesome. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And I honestly believe when you were saying you didn't want to just talk about that, I don't think that there is a this and a that. It all comes, it's all together. It's just part of the journey. You know, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't be where I am now. I wouldn't have met my husband. I wouldn't have, you know, had this crazy transformation that's allowed me to understand people, so many people and where they are, I wouldn't be able to relate to them, you know? So 
everybody has a past, just like you said, everybody has a story and everybody has moments where, especially right now, where we feel like we're the only ones who, you know, just can't get it together or we feel lonely or we feel like, I don't know about you, but just this weekend, I was like, I feel like I have no friends again. What's right. going on? Right. And then I got into an hour and a half conversation with a friend of mine from Alabama. And after we got off the phone, she texted me and she was like, thank you for today. Cause I really don't feel like I have a lot of friends these days. And I'm like, Oh, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I feel the same way. I mean, I, 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 100%, like my, my best friends, why are we not connecting more during this time? But right. it, yeah, it's a very strange, strange feeling. I'm so glad you brought that up. Cause I was just thinking about that the other day. Like, I don't understand how come, how come there's not more connection, but it's also, it takes two to tango. So, but yeah, I don't, maybe it's because people are just in a in a weird funk. I don't know. Well, I going back to isolation, now we're forced in a way to be isolated even though we might be living with family members. And isolation is right where the enemy wants us. He can get into our brains and he can mess with our thoughts and make us believe things that are so not true. And unless we take that time and make that effort to pick up the phone and call somebody, we will continue to swim in those thoughts. So, when you feel like that, pick up the phone or message someone and say, I'm feeling like this because I guarantee you they're going to probably tell you that they feel the same way or maybe they just did yesterday. <laughs> when you are thinking of it, do it. Act on it right then and there. Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, I say this. This is kind of like a, a again, loyal listeners are going to go, okay, Jill, you say this every time, but I think you're going to have to come back and join me sometime again, Virginia. Maybe in person, I love though. this. <laughs> I love this conversation and we won't have the technology issues because now I will um, know to push that button. <laughs> Click the box. Click the box. Yes. Oh, this is Virginia Kerr. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm proud of you, by the way. I, I'm so excited for this podcast. I'm so glad you're doing this. Shopping for real estate online is a real thing with BlondinRealEstate.com. You can go to BlondinRealEstate.com and you can search listings. You can book a private showing. You can schedule a consultation with a Blondin Real Estate Advisor. Whatever lifestyle you want with your property, Blondin Real Estate can match you up perfectly because they know this community like the back of their hand. BlondinRealEstate.com. It's BlondinRealEstate.com. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and if you're feeling really generous, write me a review. And don't forget to join me next week for a new episode of Two Kids and a Career.